In this film, I'm going to talk about photographing artists, and I'll focus on just six portraits. I'm going to try and explain my thinking, the questions that are going through my mind when I'm taking the photographs, how I compose pictures, and how I arrive at my final image. The first thing I'm looking for is a good background. It's the thing that can make or break a portrait. Get it wrong and the portrait will fail. Get it right and you're halfway to making a good picture. So I'm asking myself the questions. What do I want to include in the picture? What do I want to exclude? Is there anything that distracts our attention? How do I integrate the artist into the setting? And how do I make a photograph that stays in your memory, that holds your attention? In 1992, I photographed Anthony Caro. He was one of a small group of sculptors who was beginning to use industrial materials in their work in the early 1960s. The piece you're now seeing, early one morning, is a seminal piece from this period. He brought a sense of light and air and weightlessness to the work in a way that hadn't been seen before. He began placing his work directly on the ground. He was one of the first people to do this. And he helped to change the way we now think about sculpture. So how could I suggest this in my portrait? His studio was full of scrap metal with, with technicians and assistants working and he agreed to give me his lunch hour. So I knew I had to work quickly. I found a white brick wall with suspended iron hoops and I decided to make this the starting point for my portrait. I composed the picture, I made the Polaroid you're now seeing on the screen and you'll notice that I've marked the rag on the left hand side of the picture and the shadow in the bottom right hand corner. I wanted them both gone from the final image. I showed him the Polaroid, he was happy to work with it, and then when he moved into position, I could see that all the lines were working. Each line leads your eye to the artist, to the line of his eyebrows, across the top of his head, to his left shoulder, a strong vertical dropping down to his right shoulder, the angle of his right arm balancing with the angle of the metal sheet, the curve of his lapel working with the curve of the hoops, so the visual elements of the photograph are all contributing. I'm using the same principles to make the portrait as Caro was using to make the sculpture. Distribution of weight, counterbalance, fluency of line, movement. They're all coming into play here and this is as it should be. Notice his gaze into the lens. He was focused and consistent throughout. There was almost no change from one frame to the next when I was studying the contact sheets. It's as if he's saying to us, this is who I am. The Portuguese artist Paula Rego was the polar opposite of Caro. And when you look at the contact sheet for this shoot, you'll see a different expression in almost every frame. She's very open emotionally, and you see this both in her face and in her work. I photographed her with two of her own works, an unfinished charcoal drawing of a young woman in the background, and then to her left, an out of focus drawing of a second woman with her hands folded. And it's the relationship between these three women that for me makes the portrait successful. We could be looking at different versions of the same person, taken from different times in her life, so that perhaps the artist is looking back, recalling particular memories. Paula Rego's work has a strong narrative element to it. She's a storyteller, and I wanted to suggest this in the portrait. So the arc of the three heads, the implied relationship between the three women, is an integral part of the portrait. Here is another image from the same session, a closer composition where the two heads almost touch, so that you have an even stronger sense of the artist and her work. 
The direction of the eyes is important here. The artist looking up and away from us, the model looking down. You feel an almost telepathic communication between these two women, as if they inhabit the same world. In 1999, the Australian sculptor Ron Muick was working on a piece called Boy. It was nearly five metres high, and he was having to work on it in two sections because of the scale, shaping it in polystyrene and then having it cast in resin. He's been described as a hyper-realist artist because his work appears so lifelike. He spends months on each piece, attending to every hair on the body, every eyelash, every blemish on the skin, so you feel as if you're looking at a real person when you see his work. But he also plays with scale, so his figures appear either larger or smaller than they would be in reality, and this creates a strange tension in the viewer. We feel quite unsettled when we first encounter his work. He was working on this piece when we met in London, and at first I tried to include the whole sculpture and the artist in the composition. I wanted the photograph to show both the scale and the challenge he was facing working at that scale. But he became lost in the picture, so I needed to find another approach. You'll notice that he's carrying the maquette for the piece. And this gave me the idea that I could have him hold it in the portrait, so you still have a reference to his work, but one that doesn't dominate. This felt like a much better solution to me, because you can then make eye contact. You can engage in a more direct way. In his right hand, you can see that he's holding the knife he'd been using to cut the polystyrene. And this created another dilemma for me. Seeing the complete knife, especially when it caught the light, gave the picture an unsettling character. So I recomposed, I moved the camera closer so that only part of the knife is showing, and I think this makes a more subtle, understated image. I've already spoken about finding the right setting for a portrait, and I found one for this picture that has structure, white vertical poles to his left and his right, corrugated iron immediately behind him. It's very good graphically because he stands out against the dark background, but it's also vague enough so that it doesn't detract from the artist himself. Everything about the setting supports his gaze and his presence. Most of my portraits are in black and white, but occasionally I'm in a situation where the colour feels completely right. It's as if the colours themselves are demanding my attention, and this was the case when I photographed Frank Bowling. You have the three primary colours, red, yellow and blue, all subdued. You have the three complementary colours, orange, green and violet, again subdued, but all working beautifully together. And then you have this extraordinary soulful face in the centre of the composition, framed by the hat and the beard. In some ways it's a simple portrait, but when you're photographing such a wonderful face, and when the eyes are saying so much, I feel that nothing more is needed. Frank Boeing was born in British Guyana and moved to London at the age of 19 to study painting. And it's interesting that of the six artists I've chosen to talk about here, four of them arrived in Britain as immigrants. What I find so powerful about Frank Bowling's expression in this photograph is that it suggests to us the struggle he must have had as a young black artist, finding his way in the culture of the time. In the early 1990s, the British pop artist Richard Hamilton made a series of self-portraits using a Polaroid camera. He had them enlarged, and then he painted directly onto the surface of these pictures using random brush marks. I had seen the series in an exhibition in London the previous year, and when I arrived at his studio, they were there, and, and I could see immediately how I could use one of them as the background for my own portrait. These images are quite ambiguous, and where the left-hand image you're now seeing doesn't provide enough space for the artist, the right-hand image does. I knew where to place the artist in the composition and how to set up a dialogue between the two heads. 
He liked the idea and he even suggested wearing the same denim jacket and cap that he'd worn in his original Polaroids. And that's how we made the portrait. I worked in colour and in black and white during this shoot and there's a very subtle difference in his expression in these two pictures. I shot the colour film at the end of the session and he's visibly softened at this stage. He's more open. Where in the black and white image he's, he's more distant, perhaps more sceptical. I use a narrow depth of field in the picture with only his face sharp and this creates a slightly out of focus background so that you are aware of a presence behind him, a second face, a second pair of eyes, but you're not 100% sure of what you're looking at. And I like this feeling of uncertainty in the picture. It draws you in and it leaves something to the imagination. Julian Ayres was one of the first British abstract painters. She was born in London in 1930 and she knew by the age of 15 that she would become an artist and she remained true to that belief until her death in 2018. I think of her as part of a trio of artists that includes Joan Mitchell and Helen Frankenthaler, three extraordinary women born within five years of each other who dedicated their lives to abstract painting and who made work that was at least the equal of their male counterparts. Sometimes more inventive, more complex, more lyrical. She lived in a wonderful house in the country and her studio had French doors leading out into a garden. You'll notice on the left hand side of this photograph a narrow opening in the wall, almost floor to ceiling. She had this made so that she could work on very large canvases, sometimes three metres high, without having to dismantle them before they left the studio. One of the first things I noticed when I walked into her studio was a chair covered in paint. And I thought that perhaps I could use it in my portrait. Artists' chairs often provide us with clues about a person's work and I felt that this one could work beautifully in a photograph. I sometimes use what I call implied symmetry in my photographs. I include shapes that give the picture form and you see in this portrait that I've suggested an approximate isosceles triangle. Three sides equal in length providing a feeling of solidity. The top of the triangle is the parting in the artist's hair. The base is the top rail of the chair and the other two sides are suggested by the lines of her hair and her right arm, both leading your eye to the edges of the picture. The direction of the cigarette and the necklace running in parallel both help to reinforce this sense. Now, of course, portraits are not about symmetry. They're about portraying people. But to help us engage with a person without distraction, a photographer must find ways to frame the sitter. And this is how every portrait photographer, every portrait painter, every film director works, whether it's Irving Penn, Gwen John, Vermeer. It doesn't matter what medium, what century, what style. We're all finding ways to place our subject successfully within the frame so that the viewer can make the connection. Take this self-portrait by Albrecht Dürer, painted in the year 1500. Dürer is thought to be the first artist to make a self-portrait and he understood the importance of both symmetry and placement in pictures. Look at his nose, placed in the centre of the painting. The fingernail on the index finger of his right hand, again placed in the centre. Notice the way his hair falls away to his shoulders, implying a triangular shape similar to the one I use and the way the lines of his moustache repeat this shape. And then in the lower part of the picture, he's inverted this structure to act as a balancing device, like a mirror. This is just one of numerous examples I could have chosen to show how artists use symmetry in their pictures. And it's often done instinctively, almost unconsciously. 
but these are only pictorial devices used in a supporting role. My portrait of Gillian Ayres is really about conviction, about how the artist confronts us with her gaze, letting us know who she is, letting us know that her life has purpose and that her work is significant. It's not a portrait about arrogance, it's a portrait about belief. Belief in the value of your work, belief in the value of artistic practice, and it's there in her expression, in what she tells us in that moment.